Please, Dr. Pro, speak. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you all for coming out, and thanks for Rita and the volunteers for setting up this great program. Well, let me just uh, actually, uh, I'm going to be talking today about the glaucoma exam. And for many of you, that seems like old hat. After all, many of you, I'm sure not all, but many of you have the diagnosis of glaucoma and are coming here today to learn more about it and to learn about maybe new therapies, new treatments, and just to hear many of us speak about it. But I'm not sure if all of you know what we're always looking at when we're doing a glaucoma exam. What is it we're doing in all those parts? And I hope to explain some of that to those of you who, who weren't so sure. Just to back up for one thing, though, I did want to try to address one of the questions that was asked before, and it was an interesting question. And I think, um, you know, one thought about the, the, the sort of thin cornea, and that was asked of Noel, why do African Americans, uh, for instance, have higher risk of open angle glaucoma? One thought is they, they tend to have thinner corneas. I thought I would put that out there, because that is one of the theories. But to get back to my talk, so, you know, what is glaucoma? Eddie already spoke about this. Noel told you about risk factors. But in general, the way I like to describe it, it's damage to the optic nerve, mainly due to intraocular pressure that is too high for an individual's eye. So that sort of puts it at a very specific level for each individual. And classically, we would talk about high pressure, visual field abnormalities, and optic nerve damage. That's the classic teaching. And as you've just heard, you don't always have to have a high pressure to have glaucoma. However, it is part of sort of what we're generally looking at when we're trying to put together a diagnosis. But really, let's focus on visual field abnormalities and optic nerve damage. And that gets into what the, uh, what the exam is all about. Who's at risk? Once more, I don't really need to go through this. Noel just covered this in such excellent detail. But this obviously comes up. And knowing your own history is important, knowing your history of your family and what have you. So what is a glaucoma exam comprised? Well, the first part, and obviously very important, is the entrance exam. And this can be done either at home, online, if you're making an appointment with your doctor, or obviously in the office itself. Some of which you start filling out when you fill out those forms, some of which is asked of you by the technician. So the chief complaint, people come into the office and they're often asked, you know, why, what are you here today? What's your main problem? My eyes are blurry. I have pain. Whatever it is. And sometimes that can be important for glaucoma. You might report, well, I've noticed lately my vision doesn't seem to be as good or certain changes. I'm having pain. Whatever it is. And that can sometimes be important in terms of the physician, the doctor, the glaucoma specialist trying to put it together and piece together what's going on with this individual. The history is obviously very important. And it's important to ask of your family who has glaucoma. Mother, father, brother, sister. As we just heard about, having a first degree relative with glaucoma increases your risk. So it is nice to know. Many people don't know what their mother or father had or have, but it's nice to try to know that because, again, it, it's very individual for that person. What is your risk factor for glaucoma? And that's what we're trying to figure out. Your past medical, past surgical history, surgical history including also eye surgeries, and, of course, medications. And, you know, I can't stress this enough. Some folks will come in who maybe had a history of being, being treated for glaucoma and, unfortunately, don't always know what eye drops they've used or what eye drops they're even currently using. Maybe, maybe they know the color of the, the bottle. Unfortunately, that's not always good enough. It's not always that the bottle cap is the right color. And sometimes we don't know what medicine somebody's on, and yet they'll say, well, I think I'm being treated with X medicine. So it's nice to know your medicine, or better yet to bring them if you know you already have glaucoma. Bring your bottle if you have any question, if you're not sure the names of the medicines, and show the technician when you're being asked about them. Finally, the other thing that's done is uh, your vision is screened at the time of the exam. Now, the external exam, and those things that I think are specific and really important for a glaucoma exam are marked here with the little optic nerve. Well, first thing we look at is your pupils. And, you know, you may see us sort of shining a light into your eyes, sort of one after the other, sort of rhythmically checking your pupils. Why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because folks who have glaucoma, oftentimes one eye will have more glaucoma damage than the other. Because of that, the pupil will respond slightly differently to the light in the eye that has more glaucoma, the eye that has more optic nerve damage. So what we're trying to do is see if there's a, there's even just early on, without even looking at anything else, we're trying to see if there's a some, somewhat damage, more damage to one eye than the other. And that starts to give us a thought that, hey, maybe this person has glaucoma in that one eye, the eye that has the abnormal pupillary response to light. Some other things we're looking at aren't necessarily as sort of um, specific for glaucoma, motility, how your eyes move, the area around the eye, the skin and tissue around the eye, the actual eyelids. 
Now, intraocular pressure, and let's see if this video plays. And again, most of you have had this done, but maybe some of you haven't. And the most common way we do it is, is the following. I'll show a little video here. So why are we putting that stuff in the eye? Well, that's called fluorescein. We're putting that in so we can actually measure the pressure. We use this instrument called a Goldman applination sonometer to check the pressure. That tip actually touches your eye. People ask me, does that touch my eye? Yes, that touches your eye. We measure that, and then we turn this little dial when the tip touches your eye, and we turn it to a specific endpoint, and that gives us the pressure. It, on that little knob, we see what your eye pressure is. So here, in this case, it was between two and three. We add a zero to that. We know that this person's pressure is about, I can't read it now, but about 25, 26. And let's move on. What about pressure, though? Um, you know, again, I just told you how we measure the pressure. Well, people always ask me, is that normal? Did the response, did the number you just, was that a normal pressure? If I can tell you, you know, to talk about normal is not always accurate for somebody with glaucoma, just because, as we just heard, you can have a normal pressure, but still develop glaucoma. Conversely, you can have a higher than normal pressure and never develop glaucoma. However, it does obviously increase your risk factor for development, as was just described. And what is sort of considered the normal, and where does that come from? Well, the mean pressure, meaning everybody in the population, the mean pressure is about 15.5 millimeters of mercury, plus or minus 2.6 millimeters of mercury. It's somewhat skewed, this bell curve, towards higher pressures. Therefore, normal is often described as almost a mathematical concept. Normal is described as two standard deviations from the mean. So that's 21 millimeters of mercury or less. So I tend to tell people, well, a normal pressure is between 10 and 21. Okay? However, as I discussed, you can have glaucoma even with a low normal pressure. You can develop glaucoma with a pressure of 14 if you have a certain specific risk factors. Moreover, about pressure, it's not always the same. And that's another thing you should be aware of. Coming to the office, your pressure is measured. It's 21. Does that mean it's always 21? No, it fluctuates. We know that pressure tends to increase in the population with aging. That may be why, you know, glaucoma becomes more prevalent amongst other risk factors. It seems to be higher in individuals who have a family history of glaucoma. It fluctuates during the day, and that's probably one of the most important things on this slide. It tends to be highest in the early morning. It increases when you're supine, lying down. It certainly increases when you're inverted, so doing a yoga headstand. Sometimes we'll tell you with glaucoma, you can't do yoga headstands if that's something you're into. It increases with a valsalva maneuver. That's like a hard bearing down if you're lifting weights. It increases actually somewhat with blinking or very hot, hard like lid squeezing. Chronic steroid medications, things you might be ingesting, can increase it. Increase temporarily, we think, with caffeine. Some, think, some studies show that it increases with a too tight necktie. Try better. Loosen it up. Um, it's reduced with sustained accommodation. What's that mean? Well, that means reading. It's reduced with extended exercise. So, you know, I can't stress enough. It's nice to be healthy and to try to exercise if you can. Reduced with general anesthesia. We're not always getting that, but it does happen. It's reduced with alcohol. It's reduced with marijuana. People often ask me about those things. Marijuana, I get that question a lot. Yes, it's reduced with marijuana. However, that effect sort of goes away pretty quickly once the marijuana effect goes away. So right now, we're not asking people to be treated with marijuana because, unfortunately, there's a side effect of taking marijuana. So for right now, that's not considered a normal you know, a treatment for glaucoma. There are many things, as I just described, that reduce the pressure. Not all of them become an accepted medication because of side effects. Before I go to this slide, actually one thing I wanted to add, I forgot to add in this lecture, pachymetry. One thing we're also doing when we're, you know, checking people in the, in the whole exam, and I'm going through the exam here. Pachymetry is measuring the thickness of the cornea. And Noel just discussed about how the thickness of the cornea influences your risk for glaucoma. And as she discussed, having a thinner than normal cornea increases your risk for glaucoma, and it also somewhat underestimates your true pressure. So that's another part of the exam we do. And oftentimes the technician will do this with a little instrument that makes a little sound as it touches your cornea. So to get back to this uh, examination, excuse me, we look at the tear film, that's if your eye's kind of dry or not, the conjunctiva, we look at the sclera, this is the white of the eye, and this is the sort of tissue that covers the white of the eye. We look at the cornea, which is the clear sort of covering on top of the eye. We look at the anterior chamber, which is the sort of front section of the eye, the iris and the lens. And let me get into that a little bit. And here's one of the things that we look at that's very particular to glaucoma. Now, we are talking about narrow angle versus open angle. And how do we do that? How do we evaluate that? Well, we do something called gonioscopy. 
And gonioscopy actually is taking this little prism, this little special prism or mirror, and with this device, we can actually see the angle, that structure where the fluid is drained from the eye. So that's what we're doing when we take that little prism and we put that on your eye. I'm sure many of you have had that and wonder, what is he doing now? And what are we trying to evaluate? We're trying to evaluate the angle. And this is the area where the fluid is drained from the eye. And this little cartoon shows what an angle looks like when we're looking through that prism. And an angle can either be open on this side, or if you go all the way over here, this is sort of represents a closed angle in this cartoon. And this one, I can't see any of the angle structures. So the drain is being blocked by the iris in this sort of far right sort of part of this cartoon. This is how it would look if it were open. And this is somewhere in between. Another cartoon showing what an open angle versus a closed angle looks like. And why is this part so particularly important? Because the treatment is different between those two types of glaucoma, especially the treatment in the beginning. And Sarah will be discussing that in one moment. But here's an open angle sort of cartoon. And here the fluid's being made in the back of the eye. <clears throat> it comes out around the lens and into the front of the eye. And here it would have sort of unobstructed access to the drainage area of the eye. Now, in many folks, certainly the, the majority here in the United States, they have an open angle. They still may have higher pressure. But we know it's not because the actual front part of the, of the drain is being blocked. But look at this cartoon of somebody with a narrow or closed angle. Here, there's actually a physical or mechanical obstruction of the, the drainage structure by the iris. And so we know that by putting that prism on the eye and taking a look at your angle. Another part of the exam is the dilated fundus examination. And that's when we put the drops in their eye that makes your pupils big. And we're trying to look at the back of the eye, the retina. And so that includes looking at the vitreous, which is sort of the jelly that fills the back of the eye. Look at the macula, which is the sort of central part of the retina where your central vision comes from. Look at the retinal vessels. And looking at the periphery all the way out into the outside. Perhaps more importantly, though, what we're really trying to look at is the optic nerve. Obviously, we're looking at the optic nerve because damage to the optic nerve is, is what glaucoma is all about. And this is a normal nerve. A normal nerve has a rim of healthy tissue and a cup, which is sort of a central clearing. And basically, this rim of healthy tissue is all the nerve fibers sort of bundled up and sent to the back of the brain. And I like to tell people, it's almost like, have you seen a copper cable? And how a copper cable has sort of a wrapping, a sheathing, and all those little copper cables inside, if you've ever sort of worked with your stereo or cable TV. Well, the, the optic nerve is kind of like that. Basically, it's all those wires that go to the back of the eye sort of bundled up and sent to the brain. And what do we look at? What are we looking for when we're sort of taking a dilated exam, taking a look at your nerve? And Dr. Myers will be speaking more about this, but some of the things in general we're talking about. Cupping. You may hear us say cupping. Well, cupping has changed from this normal sort of configuration to where the rim is all sort of lost or damaged. And you can see the difference here. The cup went from a normal size here, and the rim looks healthy here. Now, where's the, where's the rim of the optic nerve? It's very thinned out. It's like you took a lifesaver and you sucked on it, so it's only that little, like, sort of circle with almost very little lifesaver left. And it's almost all, like, empty space. So that's damage to the nerve tissue. It's actually loss of normal nerve tissue. A focal notch is very classic for glaucoma. We're looking for actually a little sort of defect in the rim. A nerve fiber layer defect. Again, I talked about the nerve. The optic nerve is almost like a bundle of copper wires all put together and sort of that, that, those copper wires kind of going back to the brain. Well, look here. You can see there's actually a little defect in that sort of wiring on the back of the retina. And that can be seen too sometimes when we dilate your eye. A disc hemorrhage is this very specific risk factor. When we see one of those, we know there could be damage going on to the optic nerve. It's sort of a warning sign that this person's glaucoma is not under adequate control. And peripapillary atrophy is sort of a little focal loss of the normal pigmentation around the nerve. And again, another thing we see in a nerve that has glaucoma versus a normal nerve. So we've done all that. We've done the examination. We've done the part where I'm looking at your eye or the other doctors and we're measuring the pressure and we're doing those other things. But what are some of the tests we tend to do? What's a part of a normal exam, a glaucoma exam, rather? Well, as many of you already know and maybe hate, a visual field. It's not always the most popular test. It's certainly, you know, some people report that it's stressful. It's not meant to be stressful. It's meant to give us information as to what's going on with your visual field. How has your visual function been affected if you have glaucoma or if you're at risk for it? And what's the, it's done nowadays mostly by what's called automated perimetry. So a machine does it. And what is a normal visual field? Well, as you can see, we actually have a fairly wide range of vision in a normal, unaffected eye. 
Now, are we testing all that vision with glaucoma? No. In fact, when we do a visual field test, we're only testing really almost the central vision, really the central 24 to 30 degrees of your vision. And that's been described as, your visual field has been described as an island of vision in a sea of blindness. And that's what really your eye is all about. You see this vision right in front of you, but you really can't see anything beyond what your normal visual field is. And when we test your visual field, what we're doing in some respects, we're sort of dropping you know, sort of points of light onto that sort of island of vision. And we're seeing your response to those points of light. Because in glaucoma, you have a, a defect in the visual field that, that tends to be sort of follow a certain pattern. And here's an example of it. So here's what a normal visual field would look like on a Humphrey visual field. Now, there's other visual field machines and what have you, but I just chose to use, show you, you know, one type of one machine called a Humphrey. And this is a normal one. And you're going to say, well, there's a black spot right here. Does that person have glaucoma? No, that's your normal blind spot. That's where your optic nerve comes into your eye. You have no vision where your optic nerve actually comes into the eye. And so here, this visual field has very few defects. It's essentially a normal field. We call this the grayscale printout. This kind of just gives us a pattern that we can look at. And we can kind of say, oh, that looks normal. That doesn't. You may miss a few spots here and there and still have a normal field. On the other hand, here's somebody with glaucoma. And you can see they have this block of vision that's been affected. And this is a very typical glaucoma sort of defect in somebody that has fairly advanced glaucoma. And what's also very characteristic here is you have this visual field defect, which is typically on one side, one half, in this case, the upper half, before it's on the lower half. So that's also very classic for glaucoma. So why are we doing the visual field once again? We're trying to see these patterns of defects that follow a certain, you know, as I say, characteristic. And what we're also trying to see, going back to the optic nerve, is that your visual field defect, if you have one, corresponds to what your optic nerve looks like. And so here's a great example. Here's somebody with a focal notch. We talked about looking at the nerve and seeing sort of a, an area of the nerve that's damaged. And that focal notch corresponds to lo loss of the vision right here. And just because of the, you know, the way the visual field works, the way the, the fibers radiate from the eye to the brain, a, a sort of deep damage to the lower half of the nerve would correspond to visual field abnormalities in the upper half of your vision. So just to kind of make sure, sure you sort of understand why this corresponds to that. But that's what we're looking for. We can sort of help clinch the diagnosis by seeing that structure and function correlation. One thing we've known for some time, really, though, is that, you know, as we say, glaucoma is defined by visual field loss and correlating structural changes. But we found that the visual field changes actually happen after the damage to the nerve. So there's more and more, you know, sort of emphasis nowadays on trying to find damage to the nerve before you really get a visual field defect. And how do we do that? Well, one thing we do more of nowadays is we look at the optic nerve with certain scanning devices. And this is one that we commonly use nowadays, too. And this is one of the final tests that you may have done amongst photos of the optic nerve, which I showed you before. But there's a test. And one of the tests done most commonly today is called an OCT, an ocular coherence tomography, OCT scan. And what that scan does is it actually sort of takes sort of images of the nerve, and then it tries to sort of correlate them to normal nerves in a database. And if you have areas of the nerve where it's sort of where the nerve fiber layer is thinner than normal, we think that put, obviously we think you may have glaucoma and you may be at risk of your glaucoma progressing. So here's an example of somebody who has early glaucoma. Here's the nerve fiber layer with this sort of defect right here. And as I discussed before, when you have glaucoma, the nerve just doesn't all get thin together. Typically, one of the early things is a focal notch. And so here's an example of that. Somebody whose nerve looks pretty normal, their nerve fiber layer, the thickness of that nerve tissue, except for one little area. And that's very typical for glaucoma. Now, that's pretty early. And a person like this may not have much visual field damage yet but they do have damage to the nerve. And you can also see that on the uh, retinal nerve scan, too. It does the same thing. And this corresponds to this. So this is a pretty good example of early glaucoma on what's called an OCT. And we do these scans, these OCTs, in sort of a serial scan to see if there is change here. If this number keeps going down, we worry, hey, the glaucoma could be getting worse. So that's why we're doing that scan. So in summary, you know, the job of the glaucoma specialist is to try to understand the risks you know, that this person may have in front of you for developing glaucoma or for their glaucoma getting worse and to try to recommend a treatment protocol. But the patient also has a job, and part of the job of the patient is to really you know, try to understand what we're doing when we're there 
to understand what your particular risk factors might be. And of course, it's nice to ask questions if something doesn't make sense to you. Like, why am I taking this drug? Why are you doing this laser? Those are the kinds of things I would like you guys to know about. And I hope that's helpful. Thank you.